well, why don't I start and then I'll hand it off to Sochi and then back to Helen. I'm Bob Nash, Dean of Academic Affairs and uh, Professional Development with CBC OEI. Good morning. Thank you for being here. A hundred plus strong. Um, we are in a, a really great transitional period um, in this poker work because we're uh, reframing poker in a way to accelerate the number of colleges who will engage with poker and we hope the number of instructors who will be submitting their co courses through local poker and getting a badge for our exchange and making their students experience excellent. Um, to help us with that effort, in addition to our instructional designers, we've hired Sochi Tirado from Imperial Valley College, who is um, a 10 hour per week faculty mentor for us in assisting with this work and reframing and, and helping the team. So you'll see more of her. And uh, with that, I would like to hand off to Sochi. Thanks, Bob. Welcome, everyone. I am so happy to be here and to be able to help in this effort. I've been working uh, with Helen, Cheryl, uh, and Sean, and Bob to, as Bob said, reframe um, poker. So I'll be talking about that um, towards the end of this um, session. Uh, for now, I'm just going to serve as sort of the facilitator. Helen is going to be presenting uh, since, you know, she truly is an expert in um, poker and in norming. I am just happy to be here to uh, help as much as I can and to, you know, get all of us uh, poker um, trained and certified. Um, I am a distance education coordinator. So um, I have, you know, been part of the CBC OEI for a long time. Um, so I, I, I know uh, exactly how we all feel <laughs> and uh, how important the support that we're getting is. Um, so again, I'm just going to do a quick um, intro and give you some information and then Helen will take it away. Um, Helen, can you go ahead and Okay, so um, this is our agenda for today. Um, we have some really great topics for you. Um, I think it'll um, help answer some questions um, and give you the support you need to continue with your effort in your college. Um, as you can see, we do have um, the, the dates for the next uh, norming session. So make sure to mark your calendars for those. Um, and next slide, Helen. And then I just want to point out the resources that we have. Um, nothing a whole, not a whole lot of new resources yet. Um, so the first one is the course design resource. That is the Canvas course that kind of breaks up the rubric. There is a newish section. Um, I think Helen introduced it at our last learning session. Um, so it's uh, it has to do with section D. So make sure you take a look at that. Um, then we have the local poker resource center. Uh, this website is still live right now, but we are going to be updating it. So um, if you ever go into this website and it looks different or there's a message that it's under construction, um, you know, th the reason for that is um, it is because we're we're reframing local poker and um, and there's going to be some changes to it. Um, Helen, we're looking at your desktop. I don't know. If I that's know. I'm okay. I wanted to show okay. people the web page and I'm okay. going to put the link in chat. I apologize Perfect. for not. No, <laughs> that's perfectly fine. I just I thought that's what you were doing, but I wanted to make sure you knew. <laughs> um, and then we also have um, the dashboard, which um, that one is so it's really important because it tells you it gives you a lot of information about your college uh, and poker, but then it also gives you the link um, to sign up for poker training or to begin the process to sign up for po poker training. Um, so if you go into this dashboard, just click on your college and then that will take you to all of the information for your college, including that link. Uh, which is the uh, participant agreement um, to register for poker. And 
Helen, I'm correct in saying that they have to do that first before they register to po for poker training. That right? is the first step in the registration process. So you as poker leads are going to share that participant agreement link with any potential reviewers and let them know that's the first step. And then there is a second step. So they need to watch their email for the second confirmation email that they're going to get just filling out the participant agreement form does not enroll them in the actual training session that they want to go through. But yes, you're correct, Soshi. And hopefully people saw the process from the local poker resource center site, you'll go to the dashboard page and then click your college and then you can bookmark it or do whatever you want to keep that link easy to find. Yeah, and by the way, wherever your college is under, that is your um, instructional designer. Um, so um, yeah. if you're curious about who to reach out to, you can reach out to any one of them, but you, we do have a designated instructional designer assigned to us. Um, and I think that's all I have for now. I will come back at, towards the end to give you guys more information about that. Uh, the reframing work that we're doing. So Helen, go ahead. Okay, great. So one thing I wanted to mention, and I'll actually go back a slide if it'll let me. So we've got the dates, as so she said, <clears throat> it's a daunting task for us to try to keep track of who is currently on your team and eligible or you know invited to the norming sessions. Plus you may want to bring in extraneous people on your campus that are involved in poker but not directly on your review team so what we ask i'm just reminding all of you poker leads please share the norming session details with your review team and anybody else in your college for whom it would be appropriate to attend you don't have to ask permission you can just send them the uh, registration link and the dates and everything so they can get things on their calendar as well the other thing I want to, I got a couple of announcements before we go into the norming topics. One is a reminder that, how to put this in a way that's going to make sense. Quotely is the application that integrates the courses into the Course Finder Course Exchange platform. If the information Quotely has is different from the information you give us when you submit a course to us to be badged, the course isn't gonna show up. Quotely, it's very kind of persnickety. And so I just wanna remind you, when you submit a course for badging, those colleges that are certified and are now submitting courses to us, make sure the instructor and course information is exactly the same as what's showing in your college schedule. That's what Quotely pulls from. And so if the information Stacy enters based on your submission data is different from what Quotely is pulling from the college calendar or college schedule, as I said, it, the course probably isn't going to show up. So we're talking hyphens or not hyphens, capital letters or not capital letters. ENG versus ENGL, all of those things are going to make a difference. So just want to remind you, if something isn't showing up, likely the information you gave Stacy was different from the schedule. So you would just want to correct that and then we can make the correction and everything will be great. So she already mentioned the registration process for poker training. So just to underscore, we don't make that registration link public because we don't want to confuse non-reviewer faculty who may not understand what the poker training is. So you are the one who's going to be the conduit to share that participant agreement link with any potential reviewers. And the last thing I'll remind is, or mention for those that may not have heard it, we occasionally hear from a college saying we have an instructor who got a course badged either at our college or another college, and now they want to teach it at our college or the other college. What do we do? If a course has already been badged at a different college and the instructor is now going to teach it at your college and it's the same course, the title, of course, may be different in the course number and all that, but the content is the same. 
It hasn't been edited. It's not similar to what's at the other college. If it's the same course, it does not have to go through a review again. You can just send Stacy the information of where it's badged, so the college and instructor details, as shown in the course schedule of the original badging college, and then send her the information, instructor name, and uh, course identifiers for your college schedule, and she'll be able to alert Quotely that this is also going to be badged at your college. If I didn't say that in a way that makes sense, please let me know. But just so you know, as long as the course is the same, it doesn't have to go through the review process again. If the instructor has amended it, made you know whatever kind of changes beyond uh, renaming a module or something like that, but if they've made content changes, then the course would need to be re-reviewed. Okay, uh, let's go. Helen. Yeah. Janet, Janet had a question. How would we know? Well, you'd have to ask the instructor right? because uh, we're not going to know either. So uh, I, you would discuss with the instructor and let them know if the course is the same. Great. If not, we'll want to re-review -re it because it may in the whatever changes they made may have uh, impacted the original aligned designation. So you would have to have a conversation with the instructor. Okay, uh, let me think. All right, so actually this is a little ahead. We're not gonna talk about feedback yet because there's a couple of norming topics that I just wanna address with you. We'll spend a few moments on those and then we'll go into the uh, suggestions that some of our, for, that came from the field. So ignore where it says feedback. First thing I wanna mention is the use of bold or italic. We get that as a question a lot for accessibility. One thing I'll start off by saying is if you talk to three different accessibility experts, you're probably going to get three different answers to the question. But here's what we're going to tell people. Bold and italic are not contraindicated. They are not an accessibility issue. So an instructor can use bold and they can use italic. You don't want to bold a whole page or a whole paragraph. I mean, you want to use it in an appropriate way. The thing to know in terms of accessibility and student user access is not all screen readers behave the same. So not all screen readers are going to indicate that text has been bolded or italicized. So similar to color, if an instructor is using bold or italics to communicate something that is imperative for the student to know, they're going to need to use another identifier as well. So in that case, you would want to teach instructors to treat bold and italic formatting in the same way they're treating color. If it's just kind of a there for visual emphasis or whatever, and it's not a big deal, the student using the screen reader will still hear the text, though they may not be alerted that it's bolded or italicized. But if it is something that is imperative, like do the assignments that are written in bold text. That would be treated the same way we've taught you to treat color. They'll need another designator. And Sylvia or Cheryl or anybody else that's more of an accessibility expert than I, if there is something you wanna to add to that, let me know. Sylvia, I see your hand up. Well, I wanted to ask is, let's say they wanted to draw emphasis to the word not, you know, do right. not do this. Is it okay to add characters in there such as, asterisk not asterisk and also bold it as far as i know that's not a problem i i again i believe screen readers will treat the asterisk differently mm -hmm. which is always a problem for those of us not using screen readers because we don't know all the ins and outs but we're just trying to do the best we can so the really important piece is if it's crucial information that is only being identified by bold or italic treat it as though it's color and needs to have some secondary identifier so that the student will be certain to know whatever it is you want them to know. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay, good. And Wanda, say more, what do you mean, what about call out boxes? Oh, well, 
for emphasizing content. Yeah. It will and, do it um, visually. I don't believe a screen reader says call out box. So what a recommendation to do is to treat it kind of like you would treat a section. So give it a little heading, you know, an H2 or whatever, so that the screen reader will alert them, oh, here's a section and it's called this, and then it'll have the whatever appropriate text. The call out box itself is really more for visual sighted people, but there are ways to format it so that it's going to um, be presented appropriately for a screen reader. Does that answer what you were kind of getting at? Okay. Yes, thank you. Great, all right. Carol has a question, Helen. Yes, let me look. What about underlining? Underlining, never underline. Never. Okay, I'm just, it's not technically an accessibility issue. However, it is a usability issue because those of us in the online environment have all been trained that underlining means a link. So we in the accessibility review will remind slash encourage faculty and English faculty have the hardest time because they were all trained to underline certain, you know, all that stuff to have them use other designators than underlining and to only reserve underlining when as a link. So it will automatically show the underlining, but to underline for emphasis is not best practice. Uh, okay, all kinds of stuff. Thank you, Sylvia, and, um, for clarifying stuff. And did I miss anything else? Can you notify screen readers that bolder italic is being used for emphasis? Jenna, I don't know if all screen readers have the ability to designate it's, I don't know that it's a setting that is just turned on or off. It may be that some screen reader devices simply don't recognize italic and bold. So I don't think there's a way we can just tell them to turn on that setting because it may not be possible. So we just have to remember if it's something important, we need to make sure it's being identified in a way that a screen reader will be able to pick up. Okay, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. So um, hopefully you got enough information about bold and italics to make some wise decisions, help your faculty make wise decisions. The other thing I wanted to mention is we're getting some questions about STEM, uh, section D for STEM accessibility. And Cheryl is going to be uh, spearheading an accessibility series that's coming up soon, and she'll mention that in a moment. But just as a foundation, when you're talking with your STEM faculty, it's not different for STEM. All of the same guidelines are going to apply as in other disciplines. STEM faculty somehow think, though, because they tend to have a lot of images and and um, equations and things like that, that it's different for them. It's not. If they're using an image, whether it's complex or not, it's going to need to be described in alt text or in the page text. Um, if alt text would give away an answer, the same is with any discipline. The instructor is going to need to figure out an alternative quiz or assignment or whatever for the student that um, for whom alt text would give away the, the proper answer. So it's just a different way of approaching the content, but it's not different guidelines for STEM faculty as from other faculty. So you can just help them and work with your DSPS office around alternative assignments and you know those kinds of things, but just let STEM faculty know they don't have a heavier burden. They just need to, approach it in the same way that any other discipline would approach it. Um, and then, as I said, Cheryl will be doing that seminar or webinar series. She's going to talk about that. The Accessibility Center is also now promoting WebAIM trainings for all of our faculty, along with the other resources, and it includes a STEM accessibility uh, course. I'm going to put that link to their resources in the chat. So you can have that, uh, if I can get up to where it says everyone. And Helen, while you do that, <clears throat> we wanted to also make sure you, the difference between Canvas accessibility for STEM or anything else versus the challenges you have with the software. 
right. that's a totally different issue because most of the software, such as SolidWorks or others that you've mentioned, they're inherently inaccessible. So that's where you need to work with DSPS to get that plan in place. Yeah, and thank you for bringing, I was referring to Canvas content, not any kind of external application or tool that your faculty may be using. So thanks, Cheryl, for bringing that up. Okay, again, didn't want to spend a whole lot of time, just wanted to sort of give a foundation to the idea of STEM accessibility being different from anything else. And it's different in the sense that every discipline has their own kinds of, of standard or you know normal things that happen around accessibility, but it's not different in the way they approach accessibility. And it's funny because Angela just said they're looking for a STEM yeah. accessibility. So first go to your faculty and find out some specifics that wouldn't be covered in any other kind of Canvas accessibility with complex images, graphs, charts, and everything, because we're curious to find out what are the differences in Canvas. We get it that there's software, but it, when you say STEM, it's like, well, you, you know, anything, any um, subject can have a complex graph or yeah. um, chart. So give us some feedback on that. That would be so helpful. And it, it reminds me of when I used to teach parenting and the parents of 12 year olds would say, oh, I don't want to hear about two year olds. My problem, you know, it's totally different. And we'd go, no, the principles are the same. Yes, the age different is different. So you're going to talk to them differently, but the principles you're going to use are the same. And that's true here. The principles of accessibility and how they approach it is the same across all disciplines. STEM faculty or English or history or whoever may think they have different issues, but the principles are going to be the same, which is what Cheryl was pointing out. Okay, yeah. So, all right. Uh, what else did I want to say? Nothing else about that right now. Okay, a couple of norming things that we just wanted to address with you, and here's where you're going to get to give some uh, input and feedback if you have it. We wanted to talk about C8, and I'm going to actually go to the course design resources, which so she mentioned early on, probably most of you are very familiar with this. I'll put it in chat for anyone that is not familiar with it. It is a companion to the rubric. It models the same structure, so it's got all the different sections and goes one, you know, whatever. So if you look at the C8, if you have faculty that are not really sure how to interpret self-assessment, this gives them an explanation of why it's important. And really the, bit, the bottom line is that student outcomes are improved when students are given the opportunity to reflect on their progress and to make or even adjust goals around learning and, and uh, the strategies they're gonna use to get through the course. Because students may not know how or even that they should be self-assessing and reflecting on their performance, we ask in the rubric that faculty make this intentional for them. And so that's what C8 is doing. That's why it's part of the rubric. So you, as your faculty, can read all about it. Then we have tips and examples. And uh, what we've added most recently is tips for reviewers, what to look for and where. So that's going to be true of all of them. With C8, what I wanted to mention, which sometimes there's been um, misunderstandings about it, it says several opportunities for student self-assessment with feedback are present. And what that means is there needs to be, in whatever way students are being asked to self-assess, there needs to be some mechanism by which the instructor would be seeing the student responses so they can provide appropriate guidance and resources as necessary. It doesn't mean every instructor has to reply to every student on their self-assessment. The intention is that students that are off track or missing basic uh, concepts or whatever, the self-assessment would demonstrate that and the instructor would say, oh, Susie isn't getting this concept. Let me give her a resource that, or, or another tutorial or a video or something that's going to get her on track. You don't have to reply to everyone that's getting it. It's just an opportunity for you to help, or and I say you, meaning faculty, to be able to 
find out and provide guidance to students that are perhaps off track. The rubric says several. We as a norming community have determined that what we would like to see is at least three in a full 16 week course. If it's a half course, two is probably plenty in eight weeks. If it's a four week course, maybe one is fine. So they don't have to have three in a four week course, but for a full length course, we'd like to see at least three opportunities spread throughout. Um, and the feedback piece is an important aspect for reviewers to be looking for. So for example, if an instructor includes a self-assessment activity, but just has it as a Canvas page, they don't ask students to submit anything. They're just kind of saying, hey, go back and look and see if you understand everything. That wouldn't qualify because there's no feedback mechanism as part of the self-assessment activity. There has to be a way for the instructor to monitor responses and provide that guidance or feedback built into it. So also um, an instructor saying, hey, email me or submit here if you have a question. The student may not know that they don't understand something, so they don't know that they should have a question. So that also wouldn't qualify. It would need to be something more intentional like explain these three concepts from the first, uh, first four weeks of our course. And then they'd be able to know, hey, the student got two of them. They didn't totally didn't understand the third one. I'm going to give them some help. On the other hand, it's not required, as I said, that they provide feedback to every student, just the ones that are off track. So if an instructor is providing um, Canvas practice quizzes as a form of self-assessment, that's okay as long as it's not just right or wrong answers. The instructor needs to have gone into the wrong answer where uh, Canvas lets you customize feedback and provide guidance. So if the student answered the question incorrectly, there is some feedback mechanism that's gonna help them get on track. Hopefully I said that in a way that makes sense, but that's around C8. And is there a question either in chat or somebody want to raise their hand around C8, a clarifying question or something that we should have a, a quick little conversation about? Moses said it's definitely not clear at all from the criteria as written that the instructor is supposed to be able to review the self-assessment activity, which I'm unclear on. So tell me what that means, Moses. Say, yeah, say more about what you mean, Moses. If you well, would. The criteria literally states several opportunities for student self-assessment with feedback are present, right? Right. Um, and that doesn't indicate uh, self-assessment that the instructor can or will review, right? Well, that's what the feedback part means. And that's why we're norming, because we can't give a whole paragraph. So we're explaining that where it says with feedback means the instructor. Yeah, the instructor can. can or, well, because. Yeah, my, my assumption on reading this previously had been something like either, as has come up from a few folks in the chat, uh, quizzes with like really well written, um, you know, automated feedback, which yeah. granted is hard and I'm always pushing on my faculty to be like, no, if you're going to write distractors, you need to write feedback for the distractors. So. Right. You know, um, or uh, a rubric for self uh, for self review, uh, things like that, right, where the student can effectively do a self review. Uh, that doesn't necessarily require anybody else's, um, you know, engagement with with that opportunity. So uh, I, I don't think that it's a problem to say like, no, no, they, they this shouldn't be on a page with a rubric where do the thing and then look at it yourself afterwards. Um, it should be something where it can be submitted so that instructor can review and see. But I, I, you know, if this criteria could be just slightly modified with a couple of words to indicate that an instructor could, because obviously with a practice quiz. The instructor can go in and see how the students are, are performing on, right. uh, on the quiz in, individual or as a class. Um, so, you know, obviously, this is essentially me advocating for is it possible to revise this very slightly uh, for clarity. For right now, we, we don't we're, we're not planning to revise the rubric. There's little things like that. And that's why we developed this norming process so that we can just as a community include those little nuances that either didn't get into the text or would have taken up too much room to fully flesh out. So your point right. is well taken, Moses, that it, it 
it's open to interpretation as so many of the rubric criteria could be and so that's why we're discussing it and yeah I, no it's it's great I, I mean this is very useful and i've got i see other hands up so i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah up here. and that's also why in the course design resources i've included the what and why page because we want to say it's the feedback from you that's you know we want to explain that kind of stuff that we don't have room for in the rubric so thank you for pointing that out deanna I wanted to ask if the assessment needs to be content specific or can I assess the student on how they're doing with their study skills? Are they having time yes. to, you know, uh, engage with the material in a timely fashion, that sort of thing? Yes, there's two kinds of self-assessment and you will actually, uh, I think I say that on the next, no, I don't. Somewhere I say there's Two kind. I, I'm a geek about assessment and self-assessment. There's content-specific self-assessment, and then there's meta-cognitive self-assessment, where we are doing exactly what you said, asking them to think about: Am I learning? Do I know how to learn? And that's really great because they can apply those ahas and understandings to all of their courses, not just to your particular course. So we love to see both content specific and metacognitive self-assessments, but we don't require that an instructor include one or the other. We just wanna encourage them to include self-assessment at all, but metacognitive is beautiful. Thank you, Deanna, for bringing it up. And Tina. Hi, I, so I have my baby with me. So if he makes a little noise, just please ignore that. Oh, um, hi. <laughs> Um, so my question was just, I want to make sure I understand the self-assessment. Um, uh, I think it's the self-assessment part that's kind of the name that's throwing me off a little bit because, you know, if we have an assignment where the students, you know, they're assigned something and then they produce the assignment and then um, they're provided what I consider detailed feedback on the assignment and given a chance to make revisions. The that's difference the is a self-assessment is, is would be low stakes not something that's going to impact their grade. So yes, I used to get in the Course Design Academy faculty all the time saying, I assess them all the time. Why do I need? It's because the actual assessments typically impact their grades, some of them very greatly with a lot of high stakes stuff. So the, this is intended to be a low to no stakes opportunity where students can determine Am I on track or am I missing some important bits that now my instructor can get me on track? Does that distinction make sense, Tina? Yes, I just think I'm still thinking through, um, I'm, I'm still trying to kind of formulate in my mind what you're really looking for here. Um, so it could be something as simple as, what's the tell me your clear you say it's week four what's the clearest concept we've you understand best explain it to me in you know four sentences what's the concept you're having the most trouble with sometimes people call it clearest muddiest point so the student tells you i totally don't understand you know whatever it is it could be i mean there's all kinds of examples here on this page so it may be more clarifying for you tina after the call to come and look at some of the examples and see. But one distinction is that this is different from regular assessment because it's not intended to be something that is going to impact the student's grade. It's just a chance for you and them to see if they're on track with the learning that has happened up to this point. Okay, uh, I mean, I'm okay. just gonna give us more thought. Thank you. Okay. Um, really quickly because i didn't know we were going to spend quite this much time on these things so um sarah lee hong and then sylvia and then we're going to move on to the next topic and we can always discuss more later if we have time so sarah i'll just be brief i just wanted to ensure that <clears throat> discussions dis, uh, dis, use of discussion board to do this kind of self-assessment is appropriate it's not it, cited as an example. <laughs> yes and no. My personal design issue with a discussion self-assessment is students may not want to publicly proclaim that they don't understand something. 
right. it may be for whatever reason, embarrassing or shameful or whatever. And so I tend to steer faculty away from that kind of self-assessment for the reason that I said. If a student is understanding things, sure, they'll be happy to tell the whole world. So you're likely to get an, uh, an, Im, an out of balance picture of what students are really understanding if you make it a public forum. It's not verboten, just something for the instructor to consider. And if all of their self-assessments were that way, if it were me, I'd have a, a very um, in-depth conversation with them about providing opportunities that maybe aren't public facing for a student to admit they don't understand something. Okay, so it depends on, it totally. So it depends, so it's not off the table. It just best right. practice, especially for asking students to highlight their potential the content yeah. but if it's other kinds of questions that are example you know like how on average how often are you studying for this class that kind of thing sure yeah uh, then that could be one yeah. modality that's acceptable right okay, just great. keeping in mind that public aspect and student comfort with declaring that whatever it is you're asking thank you yeah thank you li hong am i saying your name right uh yes thank you okay. very much <laughs> Um, so, so I, I just want to uh, give my example and have you comment whether I this would be qualified for this uh, big requirement. So uh -huh. on every week, on a weekly basis, I give uh, like a, a one uh, a, a short essay question as a bonus assignment. So it's optional, and it's only a one point, so it's very low stake every week. But it's for students to review to give me comment about a chapter that they read. Mm -hmm. uh, four question. What do you, what do you, what's easy to read, what's hard to read, and what would you like to see extra? And contribute one question to the discussion forum uh, for future use, mm -hmm. something like that. So yeah. it's helped me, It's so I do read it after that, I have to give them a bonus point. And it's a way for me to see you know, what they don't understand. But right. at the same time, it gave me a way to review the book to see where the book is worth uh, using anymore in the future. Right, right. So is that, and, but it's done on a weekly basis. Um, not a problem if it's weekly. My comp, if I were working with you in, as an instructor and we were going through your course, what I would suggest is perhaps not make all of them optional because if it's optional, there's going to be a certain percentage of your students and it's likely to be the ones that are struggling who will not do that optional assignment because they're already struggling. They don't even want to think about something else. And so maybe figuring out a way a few times throughout the semester, something that is still low stakes and open-ended and all the great things you described, but everybody has to respond so that you can get a snapshot of whether everybody is on track. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I started doing that mainly because uh, I found out that my success rate of having people respond was yes. higher. Because okay, great. They, they, I, and I don't use the term assessment, but somehow that scares students. I just say, it does. yeah, I just want you to review the book. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like you're on the right track. And and so my own, if you already know you're getting responses from, from basically everybody and the one you didn't is already doing well or you know then you yeah. can figure it out in your particular context just as a general rule if it's always optional probably the student that's struggling is going to skip it and so you won't know what they're struggling with that's a very good point thank you thank you sylvia i just wanted to point out <clears throat> in the chat jennifer azaro asked a really good question are there links to research to support this standard we have faculty who push back on this and want the evidence. So Sorry for the eye roll, apologize. If you uh, want to address that, or if you want to add that in your resources, I just thought I'd point that out. Yeah, people often ask for very specific links because they say faculty are pushing back. The rubric was created before I came on board five and a half years ago. And so I know it was research-based. I don't know where or if, that research was collated someplace. And so we can't draw from it because we don't know where it is. Um, to the instructors who are pushing back, I would ask them pedagogically, how do they see, do they see this as damaging there? I mean, I, I would, yeah, I, I would just have a, a friendly, encouraging conversation with them and show them all the ways they can do self-assessment and discuss with them why they think it's a problem to include it 
if they want to get their course badged because it is one of the rubric elements. And so just talking with them, usually when you explain it, especially the whole metacognition part about it, invariably when I've had instructors push back in Course Design Academy, when I explain the rationale, they go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And maybe they still, you know, are hesitating a little, but they're willing to do it because they realize it does make pedagogical sense to give students that opportunity. I don't have specific research. I'm not a research wonk, so I'm not able to go find it. Perhaps somebody could. Maybe you could have the instructor who's pushing back um, go find the research that's going to corroborate this. Um, okay, the other thing I wanted to mention, there are times when an instructor may make a reasonable design decision that doesn't appear to align with a particular element of the rubric. And one example that came to mind, I was working with an instructor who most of his assignments were links to Google Docs. And of course, we like to encourage faculty to have all their content right in Canvas. Or perhaps they have self-assessments, but they aren't titled in such a way that the reviewer recognized. And so the reviewer made note, there's no self-assessment present. Here's a rule of thumb that you can use for your local reviews. If the instructor can provide a reasonable pedagogical explanation for their decision, and it makes sense, you know, it's not like totally wacky, that's fine. In the case of the link to the Google Docs, for example, he explained to me why he and his students actually found it easier to use Google Docs than to have it be in Canvas. He also was able to show me that in his anonymous feedback survey, A11, he had a question asking students about the links and what their experience with it was. And I could see that he had thought about the choice and made it quite deliberately for reasons that made sense and that seemed to be working in his course. So the rubric isn't meant to be totally rigid and inflexible. Now, I want to be clear, we're not saying it's a free for all and everybody just gets to say, well, I didn't include an anonymous survey because I didn't feel like it. That's not a solid pedagogical reason. So A11 would still be incomplete. But if somebody is saying, here's why I didn't do a particular thing, there's a pedagogical reason for why I'm doing it this way, like with the Google links, and I've thought about it and my student, you know, all of that kind of stuff, then you as a local team can say, okay, that makes sense to us and we're going to accept that as um, appropriate. What you can do is to help your reviewers train your instructors who are preparing for review to have an unpublished hidden module that has a page for reviewers. And so it explains things like that. So I didn't call my self-assessment self-assessments. I called them fun facts or you know whatever it is so that the reviewers know to go and look at those things when they're assessing a uh, C8 or the instructor with the Google links. He could give me an explanation right there ahead of time so I don't have to mark it incomplete and then have the conversation with him. So hopefully I'm saying this in a way that makes sense. We don't want to create a free-for-all where faculty are just trying to get a pass on things they don't feel like doing, but we also want the rubric to be a working structure for people that is not completely inflexible. So if somebody has a sound pedagogical reason for doing something that doesn't appear to align, you and your review team can make that determination locally. Again, hopefully I said that in a way that makes sense. Helen, to wrap this up, can we answer the one question that keeps coming up? And again, we're trying not to be pres prescriptive, right? So they're talking, Joanna, maybe you could let me scroll say up. it better because Joanna, it's in your cup to think a couple required, of times. Oh, self, we're back on self, still on self assessment. Okay. I'm inclined to think a required self assessment in the form of a quiz that includes automated responses with guidance to further resources for those who have incorrect answers would be aligned. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Just, yes. I thought everybody was going the other way. So no, no yes. as long as it has customized guidance. Right. It's when a quiz, it's when a practice quiz is just right or wrong and the student has no idea why their answer is wrong or how to fix the wrongness of it, that's when it wouldn't qualify. 
Thank you, Helen. So your explanation is is perfectly in keeping. And last one, I lied. Do they have to be different or can you use the same one throughout the course? You can use the same one. And if like in Lee Hong's case, it, it's every week, that might get boring for students. So you may want to think about changing it up to keep it engaging. Um, but you can determine so what's going to be appropriate. <laughs> So Carol, there's no, no, um, I can't think how to say it, but it's not forbidden to use the same one. You just want to think about and get help your faculty think about keeping it engaging so it doesn't become rote for students. Okay. Also, as we've already done, I just want to say again, strongly encourage you to use the course design resources shell both as a way to help faculty understand how to interpret the rubric, but also for your reviewers. We've got examples and, and explanations of the norming and really fleshing out what it is that makes something be aligned. So both your faculty and your reviewers are going to benefit from you constantly sending them to that um, because we've tried to make it as explicit as possible and yet useful in helping people really know how to apply the rubric. Okay, now we can go to the um, from the field kinds of things. And we had a college write in and ask about how do you help faculty react to the feedback. So this is faculty that are getting feedback from the review. And so they were saying, even when it's in the criticism sandwich where it's got the, you know, the compliment and then the suggestion and then et cetera, they're still feeling like it can be hard to receive a big chunk of that with suggestions for update. And so they've had a couple of faculty drop out of the process as soon as they got their feedback. I will give an answer and then I also want to hear what other colleges have come up with. We encountered that early on in the Course Design Academy process. And so we figured out very quickly, the big problem was we hadn't managed faculty expectations. We hadn't told them explicitly, you're gonna be getting feedback. And some of that feedback is going to be asking you to make changes to your course. And so we had instructors who were, I'll say it, they were offended that anyone would tell them their course was not perfect. And in that feeling of offensiveness, they, they were not able to take in the feedback. Many of you who've gone through the poker training know um, Ed Byer was our, our uh, example course. He, I'm not telling any tales, Ed was one of those instructors. He was deeply upset that he got any negative feedback, but he took a breath and he looked at it again and he realized the point is to help my course be better for students. And so he looked at the feedback and realized, I call it the V8 moment, of course I should be doing that. Yes, it is valid feedback. And so you're not gonna get 100% of people saying, bring it on. But by managing their expectations and letting them know before they even get in the review process what to expect, and yes, you're probably going to be asked to make some changes, it's not meant to imply you're a bad instructor. It's simply we can't all know what we don't know. So this is a chance for your peers to help you figure things out. Let me see, does anybody else have something, a strategy that you found is successful at your college with helping faculty get over this kind of hurdle? Jennifer. We're not hearing you, or at least I'm not hearing you. Yeah, um, uh, there seems to be something with your microphone because I'm hearing little tiny sounds in the background, but not loud enough to understand. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know if maybe I'll go to Angela and then maybe you can check in Zoom your um, sound settings and see if there's something that, that went wacky in one of the updates. Angela, what would you like to share? 
Uh, we've been running these almost monthly poker academies. Um, they're 12 hours. And right now we're, we got them paid at the seminar rate, but we're going to move to flex credit. And it runs them, it basically is like a kickstart. So they get to run through every portion of the rubric and a practice applying it and sharing it with colleagues. Right. And then that, that really helps open their eyes to what it, the rubric requires, but it also helps them feel supported in kickstarting. And it's not required, but it's highly recommended. And we've gotten amazing feedback from that. Um, about 15% of our faculty have done it. That's um, great. So it's been really helpful. And I think um, we're going to continue. There's no, been no drop in interest this whole time. So wonderful. Um, I, yeah. So that's been helpful to kickstart it. And then we also have a poker prep course that we use to support that that's based on the one that you all shared. And so wow. you don't have to do it, but it's highly encouraged. Okay, great. And if faculty have or poker leads have specific questions about because they often do how you set it up, are you willing to have them email you to or, or maybe you could put on our crowdsourced page an explanation of how you structured that and um sure okay great I just put, mind. I just put it in the chat the link okay. to the document great because we've got that open source page where we're having people crowdsource their ideas and so that'd be a great place if you're willing Angela thank you um Okay, Jennifer, great. So in chat, you offer campus-wide presentations on poker with examples of good and bad feedback so faculty know what to expect. Excellent. And including examples of the feedback from the handbook. And it's really important, she's saying, to include a lot of the exemplary so people know that it's all, not all negative. And it, yeah, just really helping them understand it's not intended as a condemnation of them personally. It's I mean, we all know most of our faculty have their subject matter expertise, but they don't all necessarily have a lot of background in pedagogy. So it's really a professional development opportunity to help them get that very specific training in a, a personal way. And so helping them understand that could be um, useful. Anybody else have a comment you want to add around helping faculty react to feedback? I have one, Helen. Yes. Um, so what we do at my college is uh, our, our instructors have to go through coursework, sort of like the at one, uh, the OTD. Uh, but then when they're done with that, then they sign up for course review where they're paired with a reviewer. And as the DE coordinator, I facilitate that and I have an orientation meeting with the reviewer, myself, and the um, instructor submitting the course. And in that meeting, I make sure to tell them that they are going to have to make changes to their course. You know, I so I try to prep them like I tell them, we have had very few courses be 100% aligned. Yeah. Um, so I, I try to prep them in that way. And that tends to help. So um, yeah, just preparing them, as you said. Yeah. And one of the things I used to say in the faculty info call, which is was our re reaction to faculty not knowing what to expect is even the most experienced online instructors don't necessarily have a course that will fully align with the rubric the first time through because there's all those little V8 moments. Oh, I don't have an anonymous survey. So it it really doesn't mean you're a bad, it's just feedback as um, people are mentioning in the chat. Anything else about that before we go on to the next? from the field uh, topic. Yeah, Helen, one thing that I do is just share the um, the errors that I had in my course when I first got mine reviewed, just sure. so that they realized that I went through the same thing. I had to change my courses and, and yeah. that seems to make it a little less um, dictated as well. That's great. Yeah, just being being open and transparent is wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So the next topic of conversation we'll spend a few minutes on is going to be probably a lively conversation. And there isn't necessarily an answer that we can arrive at today, but I think the conversation will be helpful. And the question was, how are different campuses approaching course quality for their live online courses? And so there are a lot of areas um, in the rubric that well not a lot i shouldn't say it that way there are going to 
all of the basics of the online course for the rubric are going to apply, but then there are some elements that are not included in the rubric. And so how are colleges dealing with that if they have a fully online course that isn't asynchronous, it does have some live components. Our rubric doesn't have that little section yet. I don't know if it ever will, but what are colleges doing to address that? And you can either put it in chat or if someone would like to raise their hand, I'll take a sip of water while you're thinking. We had a couple of things that actually ended up being added as contract language in our uh -huh. legislation of the contract. Uh -huh. For example, um, when you're teaching live, you need to either have uh, your head or slides. You can't, and it doesn't say this in the contract, but you can't be a black square. Right. right? Um, so that's there. Um, uh, if you save any content, of course, because of FERPA reasons, um, it can't identify students who aren't in whatever class you're going to embed that content right. in. Um, we've had a, a certain amount of pushback from faculty. For example, if, if someone wants to use a document camera and create content, um, you know, a math instructor, this came up. Uh -huh. um, uh, how does that get tagged in a way that's then useful in the accessibility world? And I don't think there's a good answer to that. I think either you have to spend the time to actually you know, create the media resource associated yeah. with that. Um, but that was one that came up as well. And then finally, there was one around connectivity. You want to make sure that if you're giving live content, you're in a place that your connectivity is good so that that is not a problem for students. Okay, great. And so that is contractual rather than any kind of professional development thing, which is a... a... It, that then, because it's in the contract, is right. that moves into... Um, like evaluation process and other uh -huh. places because it's contractual. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we, of course, have as at one the live online, which is a great thing to send people to or have them take or whatever, which does address all of the things that may go into making the live portion of a course engaging and instructionally impactful. So colleges could um, either encourage or require. I know there are some colleges that require their faculty to go through either ours or their own live online. There's all different kinds of things. And I'm seeing some things in chat. Live online is just what I'm saying. I know every college uses different terminology to mean different things. Darn our system for have a, having 114 different um, interpretations. But yeah, what, what we're talking about is an online course that isn't only asynchronous, it has some kind of live component to it in Zoom. Um, anything else? I, I thought this would be more of a topic of conversation. So any other comments or strategies that colleges are using, how you're approaching that live piece to the online course? And of course, there is no reason while well, you're thinking that I will say, and then Patricia, I'll get to you, Pat, um, is a college could create their own little section on live online for the rubric. So when they're reviewing locally, if it is a live online course, they would have the CVC rubric, and then they would have their own little add-on section that they could be having uh, in faculty um, meet. Pat, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say that that's what we're doing at okay. Evergreen is we have an equivalent, we have an equivalent program to what's in at one. So a faculty member can take the equivalent to OT to the online teaching and design class um, that Evergreen has that I teach <laughs> and also a three week add on that is the equivalent to the live teaching class that's for synchronous. And so if they want to teach synchronous, which is going to happen uh, through the curriculum committee at Evergreen in the spring. Um, they have to do at least the OTD and the live teaching. And if they're just doing asynchronous or a hybrid that doesn't include a synchronous component, then they can just do OTD or the equivalent. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I, I think there are all kinds of combinations and permutations that colleges can figure out. But I think it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't hard to put together um, the short course 
for synchronous instruction mm -hmm. because there was the live teaching class that you guys did. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, anything else around this idea of, of course quality with the live component? Yeah. Oh, no, Pat, I saw your hand. So I thought it was a new person. And it did, I, Laura, go ahead. So, okay, so I just got a quick question because, as you just mentioned, there's 114 different ways to do things. <laughs> so, at least, um, it's, yeah, at least. So, for FERPA reasons, one college I work at says that you cannot record the classes at all, just you know, for them to view later because mm -hmm. it's a, it's a privacy issue for the students that did participate. So. Like what's what's going on out there in the, the wider world on that issue? Anybody have a comment what your college is doing around the recording of the synchronous class? Piper. I yes, we um, we have checked into it legally and we find that if the students are uh, enrolled in that class, then if it's only posted to that class, it's okay. Yeah. But we also have a multilingual uh, permission uh quiz that it's actually just granting granting permission but we set it up as a canvas quiz and we have it in farsi and armenian and chinese and things like that so that students can enter and it's the first thing they do in their orientation is they give permission to appear on camera or to have their voices um, represented if the material is shared with anyone outside the class but inside the class it's fine okay oh, yeah thank you. thank you anyone there, else have a comment about that there's some in the uh, chat. Yeah, I'm missing. Okay, there's so much I, going on in the chat. No, I know. <laughs> They're just Thank having you. a ball. But I think the underlying um, premise here is that you have the rubric, and that course has to align to the rubric, whether it has live or not. And that's where, you know, the distinction is. It still has to go through the rubric and align as a fully online course. So if you've got sections where somebody said only the live uh, synchronous session can meet those um, objectives or whatever, then I don't see how it could actually align with the rubric. Because the reviewer totally. can't verify. Yes. Right. So section B in particular, where the interaction, if the instructor says, oh, it all happens during the Zoom course, th there's no way to verify that. So it, so Cheryl's point is <clears throat> the course would still need to fully align, <clears throat> excuse me, with the rubric. And then there could be additional criteria around live online specifically if a college chose to. And then in terms of the recording part, my understanding was the same as Piper's, that if it is just being shown to the students that are enrolled in the class, it is permissible because they're all enrolled in the class, whether they attended that live session or not, you cannot make it public unless you have explicit permission from the students to do that. Pat, what were you going to add? I, I'm just going to tell you that I cannot, I cannot tell you how many times in the last couple of months I've referred back to the actual definition of distance education because synchronous courses are distance education. So anything you're requiring um, for your faculty to do for distance education, including following the rubric, that applies to synchronous. And, and you just have to keep going back to that definition and bring it back up and say, look, you know, <laughs> synchronous is distance education. There's no way around that. It yeah. is. So I think for those of you who are trying to justify some of what you're doing, just go to that definition. You know, you can't, you can't quite argue with it. So, and it's just what's best for students. Got to end with that. Won't talk anymore. Thanks, Pat. Piper. <laughs> Thanks. I just have a question. Um, we had a lot of a lot of resistance just to getting our instructors to do IOTL um, in order to be allowed to teach asynchronously. Uh, we have taken all the leads at the DE, in the DE team here at Glendale have taken the live introduction to live online teaching and we've given a few workshops on it, but uh, we could never get the majority of our instructors who teach remote synchronous to actually comply with the best practices. We would never be able to persuade that. We would have so much union resistance to that. Um, so uh, 
when you're talking about this, are you saying that there are colleges that are actually getting all of their instructors to meet these standards that would be the equivalent of a quality reviewed and badged course for synchronous? <clears throat> I didn't mean to imply that there are colleges that are requiring all of their online instructors to have a quality reviewed badge. What I meant to say was there are colleges that are requiring all of their instructors who want online assignments to go through certain training requirements, some of which are like 30 hours or more. So there are colleges that have managed to accomplish that. Um, and then there are other colleges like yours where the union. Yeah, we, so, so we have anyone who wants to teach asynchronously or synchronously now, anyone who wants to teach any type of DE, whether it's high flex or hybrid or anything, has to have done IOTL. Uh -huh. they don't have to have done any training to do a good job in a synchronous. Which yeah. is unfortunate, yeah. Yep. Did I miss anything in chat, Cheryl, that uh, should be addressed? I'm looking. Um, you know, I think you probably covered everything. Okay, great. Leslie? Hi. Um, even though our instructors are doing ITC and IOTL, the fact is that no one's actually making sure they're actually doing implementing. Those things, implementing anything in whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. So it really does come down to the evaluation process, training the department chairs yeah. in that. Um, other than that, we, we, you know, we can, you know, it's one of those, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink things. So, you know. And the, the hope, I mean, a lot of instructors get excited when they realize, oh, I didn't know all that, you know, and they, they want to do it, but then you get other people that they're kind of phoning it in. And so, as you say, it, if you can get some kind of quality assurance mechanism in there, great, but all you can do is offer it to them and hope they implement. Yeah, thank you. Anything else about this topic? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, and Jennifer, but unions. And I, you know, I'm all for unions. I can sing the union made song, all of that. And sometimes um, they've gotten a little out of hand. Okay. I think, um, Soshi, do you wanna go on to ideas for future sessions or should we talk about the accessibility addendum first? Let's do accessibility addendum first. Okay. So if you were at the last DECO meeting, and I know not all of you were, but you may have heard from people, just to clarify, we are in the process of updating the poker training course to incorporate basic training on accessibility and how to review for accessibility, primarily in Canvas. We are, it is not going to be a full-fledged this person will now be the equivalent of the CVCA team and they can remediate PDFs and they can, you know we don't have the, the bandwidth or the time to get people to that level, but we do want to make sure all of our reviewers feel, feel comfortable understanding the accessibility issues and how to address that in Canvas. It didn't happen originally because the poker course was, all our reviewers were only CVC reviewers. And when we started the review process initially, we had separate A through C and D reviewers. And so the A through C training didn't include D because those reviewers didn't need it. So when we moved to local poker, we just went with the training we had, and now we're gonna come back and fill in that gap. So the poker course is in the process of being revised. The courses that people are signing up for right now is still the original version, which just Talk, says there's such a thing as accessibility, but doesn't yet address it. Um, hopefully later this fall, and we'll let you know when the course is the new version, but it will have, it will be longer by necessity because accessibility is a big topic. We also got a lot of feedback from both participants and our facilitators that four weeks was trying to mash too much into too short a time, and it really didn't give people enough time to practice and get feedback and do all that. So the course will be a bit longer, but it will be much more robust in that sense. And your reviewers will really be fully 
trained around the entire rubric. We're also going to offer a standalone short training on accessibility for reviewers who had previously gone through the poker training. Colleges can decide on their own whether they want to make this new training required for their reviewers or just recommend it. We are not forcing you to force your faculty, but we are encouraging you to at least encourage them. And there are colleges who may want to make it a requirement. It's very short. It's not going to be hard. It has a uh, culminating activity so they can demonstrate mastery, all of that. We will be making an adoptable version of that standalone poker training for reviewers, the addendum course. But just like with any at one course, if the person wants the badge of completion, they're going to need to take the at one version. So colleges can adopt it and have their own and badge your people locally saying, yes, you've taken our version. Or if you want them to have the formal at one badge, they can take the at one version. It's free just like the poker training. Um, I am going to put the registration link in the chat for it. This will be the app one version. I'm still making the adoptable one, so we don't have a link for that yet. So if that's what you're waiting for, give me a week or so to get that done. But here is the link for the app one version. It will have a badge, but our Graphic person is just coming back from maternity leave. So the badge itself isn't created yet. But anyone who takes the course, if they complete it before we get the badge officially done, uh, it, it's retroactive. So once the badge is put into the course, it will then show if they've completed the course that they have earned the badge. So let your people tell them, don't worry if you take it in the next week and you don't see a badge, it will be coming as soon as the badge, badge itself gets completed. And just so I don't forget to mention, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we can um, help you follow who is taking that course. So if you have the, a set reviewer list for your, your team that you gave to us in your poker application, just let us know when you can who has taken that or whatever your process is going to be for following it, because we don't want to get into the position where somebody says, oh, I'm not sure if I took it and maybe I have to take the, you know, the new course. So if you could help us out, that would be great. And just so you can let your faculty know, there is that culminating exercise. It's basically a badly formatted page. And we ask them to identify the nine accessibility errors and what do you need to do to fix them just so they can say, demonstrate that, yes, they understand about headings and yes, they understand about all, you know, all that stuff. It's not hard. Um, if somebody already, one of your reviewers already knows accessibility, they don't have to go through all of the content. They can just jump right to that mastery. If somebody isn't really familiar with accessibility, the content itself is very straightforward. Um, it includes not only the how to, for example, on headings, how to use the rich content editor in Canvas to set headings and what the proper structure is and all of that. It's very straightforward. It won't take long. And then each of those, I call them the big seven, but each of those accessibility formatting considerations includes a for reviewers. So it also will give them a bit of training as a reviewer. How do they look at a course to determine if the instructor is properly using accessibility formatting? So it's kind of dual duty. It helps them learn about accessibility if they don't know yet. And it also gives them uh, tips on how to look at a course as a reviewer. We totally Oh, it isn't published. Thank you so much. I forgot that part. I will do it after or while so she's talking because um, I don't want to get too distracted. Thank you for doing that. I always forget to publish courses. So my apologies. I will do that in a moment. Are there questions other than when are you going to publish it, Helen? Are there other questions about this? And DJ, I see your hand up. Thank you, Helen. Um, yes, so far, when you've been describing that standalone course, it seems as if you're only mentioning accessibility issues of uh, Canvas items. Will that course also be covering external files, captioning, 
basically does it cover every single section it item touches, element in section d it touches on there's a this page checking your pages for accessibility which talks about pope tech wave tool so it it introduces them to that and provides resources. What then about it does documents about, and PDFs and? Well, that's just for checking in Canvas. Then it does go into managing the accessibility of external files. As I said, we are not going to train people how to remediate Word documents and PDFs. We will give them resources. So if you have people that you need to become a full-fledged accessibility expert, this is not the course that will do it. This is the course for basic reviewer knowledge of accessibility. And if you need a specialist, you're going to talk to the Accessibility Center, send them to the Web AIM resources, do whatever you would do. But this biting off creating accessibility specialists is not something that at one is able to do, but we introduce all of those to people from the reviewer perspective. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Um, yes, Laura, I will go find those dates. Uh, it's gonna be the first, second and third Fridays at two o'clock and it'll be the same Zoom link as what we used before. And while so she's talking, I'll see if I can go find those dates. Um, anything else around this poker training addendum? Yeah, it will be adoptable, Meg, but I'm not done with it yet. So you need to give me about a week and then we will figure out how to let you know. It'll be in the commons once it's adoptable. So one thing you could do is, uh, what day is today? Thursday? Probably maybe by Wednesday of next week, check the commons, use the search term CVC adopt, and all of our adoptable courses will show up plus some extraneous course by some man I've never heard of. I don't know why it shows up in our search results, but it does. And you can see if the uh, poker training for reviewers addendum is available. I'm hoping to get it done by next Wednesday. Anything else? Okay, I'm gonna go back to the slides and Soshi, are you ready to talk about ideas for future? And I will find the information and publish the qu oh, question. Has anyone, oh, that's for everyone else. Um, but Joanna has a question in there for people who may wanna answer. Soshi, are you ready to take over for a while? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, Thanks, great. Helen. I'm gonna stop sharing because I need to go oh. and I don't wanna distract people by what I'm doing on the screen. Yeah, that's fine. Let me, sorry, everyone, I was, <laughs> uh, not ready to share my screen yet, but I will in a bit. Um, okay, anyway, um, what we're going to do, what I want to talk about next for just a little bit is um, about future uh, norming sessions. So you guys have done really good about emailing Helen, um, and Helen has done such a great job in just um, sending out emails and reminders for norming sessions and asking for your input as far as what you need. So we're going to continue with that. But I did want to take just a few moments here to see if anyone right now has anything that they would like to see in those future norming sessions that we already have scheduled. Um, so I'll just give you guys a, a a few minutes to think about that. And if you want to unmute yourself or if you want to drop it in the chat. Um, so any ideas for future norming sessions? That's the, the question. Soshi, do we, I forget, do we have a document for ideas like we do for the sharing your implementation? Maybe 
that would be a way to collect it? Not that I'm aware of, but maybe you guys do, Helen. I don't know. We have a document that we share ourselves, but not like a public one. But that right. is a really good idea. Maybe we can create one. Yeah, no, I always just ask people and then they email me because it's never a whole lot of them. And then I just track it. But we could certainly create a public one if we pr prefer. And Brianna, I did get your section B for STEM faculty. So gee, it looks like Leslie is suggesting applying the rubrics to CTE courses. Okay. As a future topic. Oh, I like a call a showcase where poker leads from several colleges overview and share their local poker process. That's good. And Moses, poker reviewing when there are publisher resources. Oh, Moses, that is a good one. That's a, a real struggle. I mean, I'm not happy to bring it up, but I think we probably will all benefit from talking about it. No, I think you're absolutely right. I know I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm not happy with that topic either, but it's such a reality. Um, and then, you know, yeah, that that's a great one, though. It would be great to see what everyone you know, to share ideas. Health occupation courses, evaluating external website links. Oh, you guys have some great ideas. Thank you. Sylvia, thanks for that as far as the poker showcase. Yeah, I think that'll be helpful because sometimes people will offer an idea and others will say, oh, but we're a small college and we don't have those resources or, oh, we're just new and you've done it for a long time. So I like that variety. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Poster sessions, that would be great, yeah. And if I could ask Jose, when you say the resources being housed in a canvas shell, do you mean the resources colleges are offering or the resources? That's right, Helen, because I see I've been trying to track of all the links that I've been putting in the chat. So perhaps all of that can be housed in one place because in order for me to keep track of all of those, you know, external uh, documents, it's going to be hard for me to track. Right. Um, I created a Google Doc and I'm copying and pasting and going as fast as I can, but that will be helpful to have all of that in one place. Right. So and that's we, just an idea. <laughs> we, we've we got the local poker resource center and from there, maybe we can add either a new page or on the crowdsource page links to that. So it's all in the resource center and you know exactly where to go find that stuff. Thank you, Thanks Helen. For clarifying. And to all of you, when the session is done, you can download the chat to save for future reference as well. And it looks like a lot of you would really benefit from examples um, of, you know, either like through the through a showcase or um, I saw like Angela says authentic assessments and accessibility complex materials. Um, so I think that that would be great also. Oh, Sylvia, non-monetary ideas for encouraging our, our, our faculty to go through the process. Non-flex, yeah, ideas as well. Okay, so I'll just let you all continue um, including your ideas in chat or as in as what we've done uh, in the past, you can always email Helen. She's so great about keeping track of those ideas and then planning accordingly. Um, 
anybody anything else on this topic that they would like to unmute themselves before I go on to the next topic? And I can go back to the slide deck if you'd like me to, Soshi, for the next topic. Uh, sure, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, so many struggles. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks, Helen. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys uh, an update and sort of, I'm going to try to do a little run through of what we're um, doing with this reframing of our local poker certification. Um, so um, Marina talked about this a little bit uh, during our last DECO meeting. If you were there, some of this information may be a repeat, but I am going to try to give you a little bit more insight into the work that we have been doing and what this will look like very, very soon. Um, so the goal for this uh, reframe uh, for poker certification is to quickly and significantly increase the number of fully certified local poker teams and the number of faculty submitting courses for review. Um, and what the way we're trying to do that, our strategy is to accelerate the local poker team training and the review process, the course review process. And one of the, I think the biggest changes are ways that we're doing this is by moving the badging authority to the local poker teams um, and put the position of CVC at one as the trainer and the support. Um, so I think that is one of the biggest changes um, as far as the way that we've been practicing uh, local poker certification goes. Uh, Helen, next slide, please. Um, so this is sort of a list of things that have not changed or that will not change in this new reframing of local poker. Um, you're still going to need a poker team. Um, you're, we're still going to have our instructional designers um, there for support. Um, each team member does have to complete the poker training still. Um, so that is going to continue. And each college has to establish their process on how they prepare their instructors to submit a course. Uh, so that last bullet is, you know, that's up to the college on how they do that. Um, and then just to note any of these changes that we are making with this reframe of local poker, it's not going to affect those colleges that are fully certified already. They will retain their status. Um, so any, but any college that is in the process currently, I think there's a very few that are in currently in the process, they are going to follow um, our new framework. So we're going to be working with them individually to see how this new local poker works and how we can adapt it. Um, but once we have it all clear and settled, you know, this will be the practice moving forward. Uh, next slide, Helen. And these are the things that have changed um, with this reframe. Um, so the new, we, as Helen just mentioned, we do have a new poker course um, and that's gonna include the accessibility section. So poker will be longer for anyone that's taking it that has never taken it before because of that accessibility piece. Um, and that will be ready soon. Um, and you know, will we'll be offered with whoever's be, gonna be poker certified um, in your college. Um, the training now is gonna include what we're calling a, a poker capstone experience. Um, and I'll talk a little bit of, more about what that looks like. Um, the local team is gonna be doing the th a thorough review of courses and the instructional designers are gonna be there for support. And they're also just gonna be spot checking the courses. Uh, so we no longer will have reviewers. Um, you know, in the past, it, I don't know how familiar we're with the process, but you would get a local re a reviewer to review your course. Now the reviewing is going to be done by the local poker team that you create in your college. Uh, the local team uh, and instructional designer and the faculty mentor will meet to build consensus about each course review and recommendations. 
Um, so we're going to be working as a team to be making those recommendations for the courses that are being reviewed by your team. Um, any course that is resubmitted will be spot checked by everyone to confirm alignment. Um, so now you're going to be we're going to be looking at three courses in total. Um, and after the courses are all aligned via, via the process that we're implementing, the college is going to be fully certified as a local poker college. Um, and then something else that we're going to be working on in a, a little bit um, ways down in the future is for any uh, fully certified college, we're going to do something like every other year, a check-in with CVC at one. Um, and each local poker team to spot check a course. So kind of uh, making sure that any college that is already poker certified, local poker certified, you know, keep up with their certification, we're going to be checking in once a year. Uh, that is still in the works and we don't have any, I, I have no other information for you besides we're working on it. Um, any questions so far? I. Helen, do you have one more slide for me that I think I inserted? Yes, that one. Okay, so this is kind of the graphic I created. It's it's very vague, and I didn't want to put a whole lot of detail in it because we're still working on the very, very fine details, but we do have the overall picture of what this looks like. Um, so the local poker process is on top, um, and this looks similar to what we've had in the past. So you're going to check in with your CVC OEI ID. Um, you're going to assemble your poker team. You need to establish your local poker uh, preparation as far as uh, the anything that the instructors have to do uh, to go through this process. Um, then you complete the poker capstone. Once you complete the capstone, then your local poker certified, your colleges at least. Um, so then I did, I created a little graphic for the poker capstone. And again, this is still very vague. Um, we're working out the fine details, but what it will look like when you, when you're ready to go through that capstone, you're gonna have an initial meeting with your uh, poker team and instructional designer. And we're going to have three reviews. We're going to review three different courses. So I try to break down what each review would look like. The first review, your poker team will do the review. They'll look at the course and we will establish mini norming sessions with your instructional designer. So your instructional designer will be there to give you as much support as you need for you, your team to review the courses. Uh, we'll have norming sessions, we'll have post meetings to discuss what the review was like, uh, what your findings were, what the recommendations are. Um, so that's the first review. Once that's done and the course is aligned, we go to the second review. In the second review, your team is again reviewing that second course. Um, we're thinking of having you all review in small groups. That way you guys can support each other through the review. The instructional designer will continue to be there for support, but instead of having these um, prescribed norm, mini norming sessions, we're going to be offering office hours where you can drop in and talk to an instructional designer if you have questions about that second review. Uh, and then we will have post meetings on that second review because we do want to talk about how the review went, what the findings were, what the recommendations are for that course. Once that one is aligned, we go to the third and final review. That third review will be done by your poker team again. And what we want you to do in that third review is we want you to follow your own process that you follow in your college for re reviewing courses. Um, we still have that post meeting where we want to see what recommendations were made. We want to see what the feedback is, how, you know, the, the instructor would be approached to make these remediations. Um, but essentially, once that third review is done and that course is aligned, we'll have a final meeting. And then that's when we're done with the entire process and your college becomes a poker certified um, college. 
Um, and that's what it is in the in a nutshell. I, we still have some things to iron out, some fine details, processes, and things like that. Um, but that's what we 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 have, and that's what it's going to be looking like. I know that there's a lot going on in the chat because I have it open and I see it going, going, going. Um, is there any questions that uh, you guys have? Um, and one clarification question, um, it will only be the three courses, no more, no less, to be uh, certified. Not necessarily. A college may want additional support, um, okay. or it may turn out that, I mean, hopefully it won't be the case, but, you know, maybe the first course, nothing was aligned. And so we say, hey, you know, let's do this this stage again, because we want to make sure your team is really on solid footing before you go to the next stage. We don't anticipate that'll happen, but we also don't want to say there won't ever, ever, ever be a case where it's more than three courses. Sounds good. Uh, Nika? So these are courses that we submit and we send through. They're not so ones that are provided by you that we're checking and we're making. Okay. Don't yeah, that is correct, Nika. Sorry for that. Uh, but yes, it would be courses that you guys are submitting uh, from your college. Li Hong is asking, is the capstone only applied to new poker training? No, it will be for any college that is not yet fully certified as a local poker campus. This is the new verification certification process. So rather than the old one where you submitted three courses, our reviewers looked at and we talked to you about it, you know, all that stuff. So any college where however your reviewers were trained, if you're not yet fully certified, this is the process you will go through to become poker certified. And as an example, um, my college, I all of my reviewers have gone through poker training. They're poker certified, but we're not a local poker college yet. And so what if if my college decides to not decides when we decide to go through with this, then we will go through this new uh, process. Any other, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Is there something that I should? I'm not seeing anything in chat that we didn't address. Okay. Um, Jenna, that that would be a question for Bob and the consortium. I, I don't I don't think so. She or I have an answer. So that will be something that you can discuss with them. And Heather is asking, oh, I, I, I lost it. I had I had your question, Heather, and I lost it. I oh. think it was something like, if we're already certified, do we have to go through this? The answer is no, you don't have to go. If you're certified, you're, you're local poker certified, and that stands. Uh, Jessica? Yes, I just wanted to ask, what are the submission periods um, for the, to submit your initial three courses? There, there isn't a formal time frame for doing that. It used to be we wanted all three courses at the same time, but given this new structure, it may be that you're, you've completed the alignment of one course while you're still working on the other two, and we go ahead and work with you on that first course while you're still getting the other two ready. So it's a slightly different sequencing than it was before. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. And I'll definitely follow up with Sean because since I see that there, I guess we were just trying to ask, as we ask, this is the first time we actually went through our team, went through the review. We have our, actually have four courses, but we have the courses. And so now everyone is working on to get them aligned and I will need to then go through each of the courses and then submit. I think we just wanted to know as we're working on timelines with each other, get them by this time because it's required for us to get it in by November 1. I think that's what we're trying to work for as we're trying to submit for this semester. If I'm understanding your question, we don't have a time frame requirement by when a college needs to submit. But if you have internal deadlines for things, then that may change your timeline. But we're not saying you have to submit by November 1st for any particular reason. Jessica, no, that's very um, helpful. 
That's very helpful. And that helps us as well. I think it's just that now we just see this poker capstone just to understand that process as well. But this is helpful. Thank you very much. So now we can go, I can go back to the team. Thank you. Jessica, what college are you at? Los Angeles Southwest College. Okay. That's a Sean. Oh, somebody asked about Nadia's question. Does a poker team need to be more than one person? Well, since we recommend that there's at least a lead and peer reviewer, yes. At least also, five people is good. Otherwise, you get yeah. so burnt out that it's, I mean, you can do whatever, but you're going to need a minimum of three people and really five to eight is a good number. Because you need an accessibility quality assurance type person who's going to actually be in charge of that part. And if you have an instructional designer, that's awesome too. But I think the minimum I've seen is three, so. Yes, I'm sorry, I just asked because we have the poker process right now in place where we have reviewer one and then the instructor remediates the course and then it goes to reviewer two. So we would still keep this poker process. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then jo Joanna just commented, we submitted ours one round at a time, and it was helpful because then we could see what we were missing. And I think that's the goal of this reframe also, um, is that, you know, we look at one course, it's reviewed, and then the reviewers are learning from looking at that course and making the comments and working with the instructional designer so that when that second one comes around, it's more familiar and then hopefully by the third one, it's, you know, e even more familiar. Um, that, that, that was one of our goals. And just to underscore, the goal of this process is to norm your team. So we won't be working with the instructor. You guys will still be doing all of that piece. We're really going to be focusing on getting your team as consistent and cohesive as possible in the way you're reviewing courses and interpreting and all of that. So it's slightly different than what your local team is doing in working with the faculty, because we're focusing on norming you guys as a group. Hey, all, I got a question privately from Joanna, so I thought I'd share it with everyone because it could apply. I shared a document in chat um, a memo from the chancellor's office that came out in June about the emergency conditions allowance. And if you'll see page three, it talks about uh, having the college um, offer incentivizing uh, professional development for online teaching and learning. And for your information, poker counts. Your, your efforts at poker uh, would satisfy this, this stipulation and should go in your application and your communications with the chancellor's office and uh, we presume, since it's in their memo, that that would improve your chances for the for the allowance. So, thought I would share that with you all. Can you repeat the name of that? The emergency conditions allowance. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I cut out for just a second. Ah, thanks. And could I add, Bob, that a lot of people haven't heard about it even de coordinators haven't heard much about it because i think the vice presidents and that level are the ones that are handling it so you could just communicate with your vice presidents most of those people are seem to be on it yeah and this particular clause might be missed so you could remind them it's in the memo and um i don't think the chancellor's office would uh prevent a college from getting an allowance if they didn't have uh pd in this area but it, we can presume that uh, their chances would improve if they do, if you do have local poker or any other uh, PD uh, for your faculty in online teaching and learning, uh, mention that in your application. Uh, Bob, Jennifer asked, does that count for incentivizing instructors to get their courses poker aligned? You may have answered that already. Um, if I understand the question, anything around local poker that we've described today and your efforts, if you're fully certified even, um, those efforts 
it, given what I read in the memo, would satisfy the stipulation because you are incentivizing PD for um, for online teaching and learning. And uh, part much of poker is about PD and uh, training the instructor and the team. All right, any other questions around local poker and this new process? Oh, so she, I'm not sure at the very end, did you, so when you're all finished and you're certified, yay, you will still send in the information for your locally aligned courses so that they can get badged. Okay, so your form will change on your dashboard and then that's how you get the little badge. Yes. Yeah. So that that part remains the same. Yes. All right. Um, so I just I want to point out again that that um, our poker resource page will be changing to reflect all of these details and, and what the new process is. It's going to take us a little time. So uh, we will be. Um, taking down some of the pages um from the from the old process and uh, you know replacing them with with the new information um but if you have any questions or if your college is getting ready you know you can always reach out to your instructional designer and they can help you with the process and answer any questions that you may have um, anything else, uh, Helen, Cheryl, or Sean, that you guys would like to add about this? Not about this from me. Nope, sounds good. Uh, Jennifer just asked about the September 1st deadline. That's a chancellor's office thing, so you'd have to ask them. We really have no control over anything about that memo. We were just sharing with you that RPD does count as a qualifying event, but you'd have to talk with someone at the chancellor's office about deadlines and extensions or whatever. Or, or as uh, Joanna suggested, talk to your VPI, your vice president of instruction probably knows the status if you applied for the allowance and what the status is. And you can then uh, share with him or her that uh, your local poker efforts count for, for that stipulation. Right. Let me quickly see if I can get to the dates again. Yeah, that there first go. slide, there you go. So Jackie and whoever else, here are the dates for the norming sessions. And then Laura put in again in chat, the accessibility series that I lead just colloquially happening on the first, second and third Fridays of October at two o'clock. And the same Zoom link is what it's always been. All right. So that's all I have for my updates and my um, information, Helen. Anything else? We still have a few minutes left. We do. I don't, I mean, there's things, but does anybody have a burning question that you would like to make sure gets addressed today? And then we'll also take your list of all the topics you mentioned and compile that and go for next time. Angela. Uh, sorry, I don't know if it's burning, but I just was wondering about the self-review prep form, if the section D will be added to that. Uh, we could do that, yes. Let me make, make a note of that. That'd be really helpful. Thank yeah. you. Sorry if you hear me typing, I'm wanting to get the note. And the topics for the accessibility series. The first one is using, I'll see if I remember them, making documents accessible. Second one is using PubTech. And the third one is how to review section D. So the first two could be applicable to anybody, any, your faculty and reviewers. The third one, probably just your reviewers. We are not officially, Sarah, adding section E, if you mean the equity from uh, Peralta, but we know colleges have, Southwestern, for example, expanded their rubric to include a section E, so you're free to do it as a college, 
But at this point in time, we are not going to be amending the official CVC rubric to include that as a separate piece. Uh -huh. uh, Sally, we don't know yet. It, it, Bob, plug your ears. The Chancellor's Office has to approve the funding for the Pope Tech dashboard, and they move at a glacial pace. And so all we hear from Dawn is, I don't know yet, I don't know yet. So we hope it's still in the works, but we don't know yet. As of yesterday, she said it's still in the works, but they haven't made their move yet. Yeah. And there was uh, a question about effective badging that might be right. for Bob. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Julie. Um, number one, there's a handful of people at your college who have access to the CBC Exchange dashboard, where for your college, you can get your statistics on how many students are cross-enrolling and uh, you know are they going out or coming in and all that you can find. And then uh, generally at each DECO meeting or every other DECO meeting, Marina will report on um, overall what the exchange is doing for improving student uh, access to these courses and which courses are being searched for in greater numbers and all that. So if uh, you can attend DECO meetings, um, that's a, a way to get that information. In the pause, I just like to thank you all again for being here. And uh, we had over 200 strong at, at the peak period. Really appreciate your dedication. Um, you know, there's been some talk in, in the last DECO meeting about the status of local poker and that those conversations will continue and a priority. Um, it's true, we have never kicked a college out of the consortium for not having local poker, but uh, I'd like to remind you all, and, and you probably know this as well as anyone, the feedback we get from faculty who have gone through the alignment process is, is often like this. That was the best professional development for online teaching and learning I've ever had. So we really appreciate that. That uh, speaks well to the skills of our instructional designers and the process itself and your work in, in helping do that. Um, and also remind your uh, college uh, administrators of these benefits. They, they not only uh, have this great PD going on, but they improve student experience when uh, the courses are aligned, success rates will go up when we'd love to encourage any college that wants to, to uh, share data with us on this, because we'd love to do a research project, but we can't do it without your IR department. And um, once these courses get badged, of course, they are uh, pushed higher up in a student search in the CBC exchange. So they assist your college in getting more enrollments and getting students in the courses that are of higher quality. So there's lots of inherent benefits to local poker um, that justify your time and your college's energy. And I also want to thank everyone for, uh, for attending. I want to thank Helen for her expertise and everything she shares with us. I as a DE coordinator, you know, we are so grateful for your knowledge and for putting things into light and answering our very complicated questions. You um, can say what's true. I'm a know-it-all. I've been <laughs> called it before. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, that is all we have for today. Uh, our next uh, norming session is scheduled for December 14th. And again, if you have any topics, send them to Helen and we will add them to our list. Thanks everyone. We'll and this recording will go on the homepage of the Local Poker Resource Center as soon as it's rendered. And we'll leave a pause here if you want to save chat. Thank you. Nice meeting you, Soshi. Thank you. Nice to meet you all as well.